All right, we're back with Talk to the Neighborhoods. I'm Joe Heisler, your host tonight. Uh, all politics is, is our usual want. Uh, continuing our election 2014 coverage as we close in on the primary season. And, of course, uh, in a little less than two weeks, the state Democratic Convention is on the horizon in Worcester. Delegates will be gathering there. Martha Coakley, who was on earlier, looking for, among others, uh, looking for 15% of the vote. Joining me now to talk about it, guy who's, uh, eh, he's got some background in this uh, business and uh, has been following, of course, politics for many years. An old friend, Boston Globe op-ed columnist, Tom Keene joins us. It's a pleasure, Joe. Nice to have you here, my friend. Well. How important is the uh, Democratic Convention to these candidates? For the people who don't make it? Yeah, well, for them, Very important. certainly. Uh, um, of course, uh, there's no question that Martha Coakley gets 15%. and It uh, appears that Steve Grossman gets 15%, yeah, right. Easily. So yeah. the answer is that for the three people who may not get 15%, and that looks pretty likely, it's extremely important. Because once they're off the ballot, they're off the ballot. Um, I don't, I don't think, I don't, so I think, I think that conventions have kind of a negative effect. They cull, but they don't necessarily, the people who are left still face each other in the primary. And, um, and that's, and a lot's going to happen between June and September of the primary. An awful lot's going to happen. Okay. Who's the candidate of, of not to, we're not talking about Martha Coakley and Steve Grossman, but which of the other three candidates does uh, uh, Steve Grossman, does Steve Grossman want them on the uh, ballot? And if so, who? Uh, what about Martha Coakley? Does she want them on the ballot? Well, you know, you've got you've got Don Berwick and uh, Joe Avalone, both of whom come out of a healthcare background. Mm -hmm. Both are physicians, I believe. Well, yes, they are. Um, uh, Joe, I think uh, Joe Avalone, I believe, was COO of Blue Cross Blue Shield, and and Don, of course, was running Medicare down in uh, down in D.C. Um, I I, uh, I can't imagine Steve seeing them as real challenges to him. Julia Kayem, who um, was a columnist at one point at my paper, right. the Boston Globe, um, and also has a real expertise in national security issues. Um, you know, there's an argument to be made that she somehow would eat away at Martha Coakley's support, but that argument, of course, presumes that people vote merely on the basis of gender. <laughs> I'm increasingly less persuaded that that's true increasingly less persuaded, that somehow she splits the woman's vote, so therefore all the men flock to uh, Steve Grossman. I suspect that that's not the way we're going to see this play out at all. I just, I just don't think that th those, issue, those, those factors may have been more important 5, 10, 15 years ago. I increasingly think they don't matter that much. So I, in all honesty, I think that probably Steve Grossman would just as soon be rid of the dis distractions and be able to take on Martha Coakley directly. Head, on, head to head, one on yeah, one, one, of on course. One. Uh, uh, and as uh, you may or may not have heard, of course, uh, she's been in this position before where she's the odds on favorite. Uh, uh, yet, there's so many candidates in the race, she hasn't scared anybody out of the race. And uh, are we likely, in your mind, to see uh, a lot of movement? Yeah. Uh, so, the, the, the polling shows her at. I don't know, depending upon yeah. which one, you know, over 50%, certainly right. 55%. Uh, right. The polling right now shows they're easily beating Steve Grossman in September. You know, as I said, there's going to be a lot of movement, or potential for a lot of movement over the summer. I mean, I think it's really pretty fair to say that no one's paid attention. You know, the insiders pay attention at this point. But the general electorate, I mean, they don't even know who these names are. They really don't. And, you know, Martha, they, why does Martha get high poll numbers? Well, she's better known. I mean, yeah, they do remember her from when she ran against Scott Brown. They know she's attorney general. So you always see the, the most well-known name sort of float to the top. Steve Grossman, poll second. Why? Well, he's the second best known. I mean, it doesn't really tell you anything. Mm -hmm. I don't think people have actually... So way too early. I, I think it's still way too early. I mean, you can say yeah, it's presumptively going to be Martha's, and maybe it's going to be, but... Um, but I do think a lot can potentially happen over the summer. Having said that, um, and I, I heard the segment before when Martha Coakley you know, made, made clear she's not going to take any vote for granted. I think, I think she's very cognizant of this at this point. Um, but I also think that the Scott Brown-Martha Coakley race, um, people beat up on Martha Coakley way too much for what happened there. What happened there was a very interesting moment of time where you had the rise of the Tea Party, the disillusionment, 
uh, or the, the potential disillusionment with national health care. If you remember, the Obama administration was right. looking for that final vote to be able to put them over yep. the top. Scott Brown said he would stop it. Um, and, and he was, he presented as a very exciting, novel, very different kind of candidate who was just not more of the same that people had seen before. A lot of, I, out of big yeah. money, out-of-state money flowing yeah. into the race. I mean, everyone makes this, you know, the big deal about Martha Coakley and the line about shaking hands outside of Fenway Park. Whether she had said that or not, I don't think the race would have been different. I think what really happened here was the Scott Brown dynamic, and it caught everybody by surprise, not only Martha Coakley's campaign. I don't think that dynamic is possible this time around, at least in this Democratic primary. I don't think there's anything, any dramatic movement out there. You will have kind of a face-off between Steve Grossman and Martha Coakley. And, you know... One way or another, whether one way there's or another the candidate in the race or right, not. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, some would suggest that it may not matter uh, that uh, uh, this is the year you may see a Republican governor. All that's gone wrong, whether you can lay it all on... Uh, Governor Patrick's doorstep, uh, uh, many people are, and uh, you know, there are a, a number of issues around the management of state government, certainly. Uh, may not matter. Charlie Baker, or, well... It'll be Charlie Baker. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think we really need to have but, a debate over that. But right? now, here's my question. Is, are, are you believing, is this a, a kinder, gentler Charlie Baker? Do you buy that? So, you know, I, I know Baker, and I've known him for a number of years. I thought that the Charlie Baker who ran four years ago was not the Charlie Baker I know. It was, um, he came across as mean, spirited, almost snarling, very negative. And maybe, you know, maybe that was the advice that he was giving or he, given or he believed that in order to topple an incumbent, you need to knock him off, you know. And so you have to, you have to in effect, go negative. Um, but in general, that has not been Baker's style. But who knows? I mean, you know, now, of course, he's come back and, you know, he's let's make Massachusetts great, I think is his slogan. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's very positive. He's reaching out to a lot of groups. He, he actually rhetorically has shifted very much, I think, towards the left. Um, he sounds like a progressive to my mind. You know, he's, I mean, his number one issue now is income inequality. <laughs> and, you know, and he gives speeches talking about, you know, <coughs> Two communities, two Americas. I mean, he sounds like uh, like um, former vice presidential candidate John Edwards, if you remember him. Yes. Uh, well, or uh, Deval Patrick when he first was running. Right. Uh, uh, of course. Uh, now, uh, there's some other uh, races on the ballot, some interesting ones, uh, as it turns out. Uh, certainly on the Democratic side. Uh, for and only on the Democratic right, side. And Attorney General uh, Warren Tolman. Uh, in Maura Healy uh, for in the treasurer's race, well, uh, there's a number of uh, candidates there. Uh, even Lieutenant Governor, my gosh, drawing a crowd. And I, I guess we shouldn't be surprised an open seat on the Democratic side, given the history. Right. Uh, my, I think the most interesting of those races is the AG race. Um, certainly, I thought that when Warren Tolman got in it, that he would be kind of the easy favorite, and maybe clear still the field. Is. Yeah, clear the field. Um, he hasn't, and he has gotten a lot. And, and his opponent, Moore, has really gotten an enorm enorm enormous amount of attention, and a lot of it very positive, I yeah. think. So um, that'll be a really fascinating one to watch. I assume that both of them make it through the convention, and that they face off against each other. And you know, Warren's clearly going to have a lot of labor support, given his brother, um, right? But, Stephen. Right, Stephen, who uh, uh, Stephen Tolman. Um, Head of the F of L C I O in Mass. In Massachusetts, so. right? So he'll get the he'll get the labor support, um, but um, I, I think this is be a pretty exciting race. I mean, it, it people I think like to see races where the sort of heir apparent is not necessarily going to get it, um, and I think that's probably a general critique, by the way, of the governor's race, which is that you sort of have this sense of heir apparent. You know, it's it's. Martha Coakley is attorney general, so now she moves up to governor. Or Steve Grossman, is treasurer, moves up to attorney uh, to, to governor. Um, the three outsiders who are running, and they really are outsiders, have not been able to break through that at this point, though. Um, but I do think sometimes people like to see an outsider or someone different. And by the way, eight years ago, that's what we had with Deval Patrick. I was going to say, uh, but uh, 
what's changed? Uh, How come there's no Deval Patrick in yeah, this race? Yeah. It's, it's a good question. I, I wish I get, could give you the answer. I, I thought that maybe um, Julia Kayyem would have been that person, but does not seem to be catching fire in the same way that Patrick is really able to do so. People were really craving change back then, and he offered it. Maybe they don't crave change as much. I mean, part of the problem, to be frank, is that Massachusetts, for all of the scandals and so on, Massachusetts really is doing pretty well. There isn't a sense that we're a basket case as a state. We're not. You know, we've got a very strong economy. We went through the recession like every other state went through the recession, but we went through the recession better than almost any other state. We've bounced back more quickly. We have a pretty diversified business, uh, a pretty a diversified economic uh, uh, outlook out here. Um, and I think that, um, I, I think people are feeling relatively good about the state, relatively good about the state. Um, Yet, uh, 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 Carmen Ortiz says there's something rotten in uh, Massachusetts uh, state government now. Uh, well, and, well, and what she's referring to is the, you know, the fact that we have, you know, various scandals, uh, a lot of corruption yeah. going on, and absolutely, you're right. Well, what's your, ta what's right. your take on that? Is it uh, patronage or is it uh, corruption? So the, if I were the prosecutor, so I say it's <laughs> corruption, and the fence is saying it's patronage. Um, you know, it, 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 it is... It's been going it, on a long time. Right. I mean, it's I mean, not The unusual. thing is, it is patronage. Yeah. And I think what's happening is that we're sort of coming to the realization that patronage can be corrupting. And that what we really have to do is get rid of it. That, yeah, you can choose, obviously a politician, and political party and so on, chooses and, and uses non-merit criteria for selecting senior people in an administration. But when you're talking about hiring a psychologist to work for the DCF, for example, Department of Children and Families, Right? That person should just be hired on the basis of that person's merit, period. Right? No, pol no politics should come into it. It shouldn't matter whether you gave or didn't give. And if it starts to matter, then what we're really doing, and the corrupting thing here is that what we're really doing is deserving the kids in that case who are supposed to be helped by this particular department. And that's what you see across the board. If you hire people who are less qualified because they have political juice, then you actually are. It really is corrupting. And I think that's what's going to be going on here. A lot of big names popping up in the uh, testimony, not the least of which uh, Senate President Theresa Murray. Uh, speaker has been mentioned previously. Well, turns out even some uh, uh, judges uh, <laughs> have hired, have lobbied for money, have uh, uh, given recommendations, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I get, the, I get the judges lobbying for money because, like any department, they got to get money from the legislature. Um, and maybe what happened, of course, is they're given that same quid pro quo. Mm -hmm. Sure, you want some money? Hire my nephew. Um, that's what we need to get rid of. And I, I really do think you'd have to get rid of it. You know, to the victors belong to spoils is an old, old maxim that probably should be done away with. Well, uh, turning uh, locally here, of course, uh, the election that we've all been consumed with, uh, and now the new administration of Marty So, Walsh. Which is great, because we won't have another mayoral election for another 20 years, so we don't have to worry about this anymore, right? Uh, it was a good one, though. and uh, It was a great election. How's Marty yeah. Walsh doing? Uh, you asking? I, you know, I, I, I Got think Got some big shoes to fill there, but... but. I think that he is he's doing a few things well. He's... Um, uh, he, he's moving very slowly. He has a number of issues in terms of hiring staff. He's certainly not as diverse in his hiring as he promised that he was going to be. I think he's kind of feeling his way through. I don't sense a lot of um, momentum from the administration, um, and I don't sense um, that they're grabbing at big issues and really making them their own and starting to own, own this mayoralty. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, no one dislikes the guy. He seems to be managing himself very well um, in terms of carving the course that he needs to carve. Um, he has... Likeability rating is still... Likeability is very high. Um, he's doing all the right things in terms of showing up at neighborhood events. He's not in the cloister at City Hall. Um, and he does, on a few issues, really seem to be parting ways with the, with the previous administration. I think 
particularly when it comes to how he handles development issues within the city. Um, he's making clear he doesn't play favorites, uh, which is good. Um, if you're on his bad list, well, he doesn't have a bad list, or at least we're certainly not, not aware yet. of a bad list. Yeah. <laughs> And it's a really important thing. I mean, and again, you know, this is actually kind of goes back to what we were talking about in terms of, of patronage. You know, it's, it's kind of a similar type of patronage within the city. Main thing, one of the huge things that a mayor is responsible for is how that city grows, the shape of the city. And if you exclude certain developers or certain ideas or certain kinds of projects for non-substantive reasons, it becomes a real problem. I think, I think what Walsh is doing is very much trying to make sure that he's a substantive mayor mm -hmm. in terms of, in that regard. Will he hit uh, a wall at some point here? Uh, uh, many people thought it might be uh, the first uh, union contract that comes up for approval, but yet he seemed to uh, uh, clear that hurdle uh, he, he, fairly he, easy. Right. And perhaps maybe it was part of it was, uh, you know, the coverage of it or what was made of it uh, was made a big issue during the uh, campaign, right. yet it didn't seem to kind of take hold uh, 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 when it came up for uh, uh, a vote and approval and... and uh, you know, it, it sailed through. I mean, you know, in union contracts, most people kind of look at them as, you know, sort of, it's always a debate about how much money do you give the union. But it's not really that debate. Really, a lot of times the debate is about what kind of reforms can you make within a particular department, in this case, the fire department. And I think what happened is that you had, you know, a reasonable pay package, but you also really didn't get any reforms out of it. And that, that's harder to argue. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of change that went through, particularly in terms of civilian oversight of the department. Um, so I think it's a lost opportunity. I'm not as big a fan, but you're right. The contract went through and sailed through, and, <laughs> and he got over a hurdle. And he does seem, I mean, one of the things that he promised is that you would not see from him the same kind of almost drag out struggle that you had between Menino and the unions on almost every single contract, including years where the contracts just never happened, where you had delay after delay after delay. So the, in effect, the workers are working without a contract. I don't think you're going to have that problem with um, with Marty Walsh. And that was one of the well, things he promised. Maybe it was him. almost a relief to people. Uh, again, Tom Keene is a columnist for the Boston Globe. His uh, column appears twice weekly. Yeah, Tuesdays and Sundays. Tuesdays and Sundays. Must reading. Uh, and uh, we've got just a couple of minutes. I, I've got to ask you, because we talked the last time about this, and of course uh, about Edward Snowden, of course. Uh, and he just appeared on uh, NBC. And... Uh, when I asked you before, uh, a traitor or hero, uh, well... I'm, I'm on the hero side. Yeah. Yeah, and I know. And, and I, I, no, you haven't changed. No. Um, no, I, I, not, not at all. I mean, I, I think that, um, that what Snowden did is akin to what Daniel Ellsberg did back in the 60s with the Pentagon Papers. Um, and it was absolutely a technical betrayal of his oath of secrecy. Um, but some, but I do think it is critical, it was critical for the American people to be aware of this. This has provoked a very much needed debate about intrusiveness and privacy, and it's a debate that we weren't having in this country. And that's really why I think he's done an incredible service. I also think, you know, I mean, he said in, in, in his interview, and I think he's right, you know, show me who's been hurt. It, you really can't. I mean, it's not like he went out and released the names of covert agents in you know, Bulgaria or wherever. He didn't do that kind of thing. He talked, he gave us the general notion of programs mm -hmm. that are going on and how intrusive those programs can be. But he didn't reveal specific information that had been gleaned from them. Uh, does the uh, Obama administration ever cut a deal to allow him to kind of come back? Uh, no, the Obama administration will not. Um, maybe a subsequent administration does, but I'd be... Uh, given the rhetoric we've seen out of, uh, out of uh, the Defense Department, out of the CIA, even out of the White House, I can't imagine that happening. Um, you know, Snowden obviously gave an opening in his interview saying that he'd like to be back in the United States. Yeah. Um, and that's not a surprise. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think not he's like a happy camper happen. where he is. But I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Well, in talking about uh, subsequent administrations, are you uh, on the uh, Hillary Clinton bandwagon? I don't join. I don't join bandwagons. Have you, have you, have you got? Uh, you're waiting with bated breath for her book, uh, 
Uh, what do you think about how, I mean, it appears that she's going to run, but how they're kind of uh, rolling this out. Uh, so, uh, is it? Uh, so, you know, I've, I've, I've read a, a, a lot of books about her, and, and uh, there's, there's one by a, a journalist who covered her at the um, State Department for four years um, that was exceptionally good and, and exceptionally positive, I thought, for a journalist. And then the other book I recently read was the one by, uh, um, by Robert Gates, his memoirs, his Secretary of Defense. Um, and Gates was, is a Hillary fan, which was really a surprise to me. Because, you know, here's a, a Republican, you know, Defense steep, Secretary, Defense Secretary, 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 Secretary of State. And, and he and Hillary got along famously and actually built bridges between those two departments that had never existed before. And in dealing with the Obama people, he recounts time and time again how an issue would come up and he and Hillary would be the allies against everybody else in the Obama administration. Um, I, I think that she has um, some really solid um, credentials in terms of defense-related issues, international issues. I think that we would probably find she's, she's no cream puff on this stuff. She's, she's a tough woman, um, and she really comes across like that with, with an increasingly good sense of judgment. I mean, her history is extraordinary in terms of what she's gone through, and particularly with, with her time at, uh, as Secretary of State. I really think we'll find that you know, she will be probably the best prepared president in terms of understanding the world at large that we would ever have if she becomes elected president. You know, I think there's a lot between now and then, <laughs> um, including a few Republicans and maybe even some Democrats who might disagree. Well, uh, you know, like everyone, uh, we're following it. Uh, uh, much to watch if you're a, a fan of politics. Uh, of course, uh, this fall, uh, several races on the ballot, not the least of which is the uh, gubernatorial race. Uh, just a program note. Uh, uh, Steve Grossman, the state treasurer, who's also running, will be here next week on Talk in the Neighborhoods as we uh, uh, continue following the race in the run-up to the convention. Uh, last but not least, uh, can the Red Sox come back and still... Uh, so I was at the game yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it was funny. It was like when they were in Atlanta, I was thinking, wow, I might be at the seventh win in a row. And I, I, it was actually unbelievable, seventh win in a row. Unfortunately, as we're on air right now, the Red Sox are behind, I think, 3-0, but maybe they'll come back. Well, um, You know, can they come back? Uh, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. I mean, this is a, it, they're not that many games behind. Anything's and, possible. And I mean, they just won seven in a row. As in uh, politics, so in sports. Right. Uh, Tom Keene is a columnist for the Boston Globe. Uh, his column appears every Sunday and Tuesday on the op-ed page. Must reading. Uh, an old friend as well. Thanks so much for coming. My pleasure. And Thanks, us. Joe. Uh, you're watching Talk of the Neighborhoods. We're here tonight and every Monday night at the same time. We'll be back next week. Until then, for the entire staff and crew here at BNN, thank you for watching. Have a pleasant evening. Good night.